If I have one message, that's what this, my message has been all along, and it still is. This is not a scientific debate. It's a political debate, but it's a political debate being made to look like a scientific debate, being camouflaged as science, being dressed up like a scientific debate. And we now know why people do that. In December 2015, the world's countries will converge on Paris for COP21. Now, COP21 stands for the 21st Conference of the Parties, the countries of the world coming together to negotiate a global solution to the problem of climate change. For several decades, individual countries, companies and communities have been working towards reducing their carbon footprint and impact on climate. But as a global community, we've never been able to agree on an international plan of action. The negotiations seem to just go round and round in circles. After 21 years of conferences, why haven't we been able to reduce our global carbon emissions? The answer is complicated and multifaceted. I've been interested in one piece of the puzzle. A major roadblock delaying climate action is climate science denial. Despite the overwhelming agreement among climate scientists, there's still a small proportion of the population who persist in denying the scientific consensus that humans are causing global warming. Here at the Global Change Institute at the University of Queensland, I've been investigating a crucial question. What do we do about science denial? Can we remove this roadblock preventing climate action? I've talked to some of the world's experts on climate change. I've spoken to cryosphere experts in the freezing snow of Canada. I've talked to coral reef researchers and BBC filmmakers at the Great Barrier Reef. I've spoken to cognitive psychologists and poured ice buckets on them. I've even poured ice buckets on myself. Solving the problem of climate science denial starts with a fundamental question. Why do some people reject science? To answer this, I ran psychology experiments that measured how much people agreed that humans were causing global warming, as well as other aspects of their attitudes towards climate change and their demographics. I found that the biggest driver of climate science denial isn't age, it isn't gender, it isn't even education level. The biggest driver of climate science denial is political ideology. Climate change denial in the United States is almost entirely motivated by politics. A lot of scientists have thought that it was a problem of science illiteracy, that it was a problem of public understanding, that if we just explain the science better, that then we would solve this problem. And that doesn't work because the problem is not being driven by lack of access to information, although that may play a role in some cases. The problem is being driven by people not wanting to believe the science because they don't like its implications. People who are very enthusiastic about free markets and who think that government should not interfere with free markets, that they tend to reject the findings from climate change, uh, climate science, based on that uh, ideology. It's frustrating, right, because there shouldn't be a serious role for politics in climate science, in my opinion. The science is science. To get to the bottom of that, you need to understand what's driving global warming. Professor Mike Ranney from the University of California in Berkeley is interested in people's understanding of global warming. He ran one study where he asked 270 Californians to explain the mechanism driving global warming. Not a single person could do it. It turns out in our research that basically 0% of people know the mechanism of global warming. That if, is if you ask them uh, what's the physical chemical mechanism by which the Earth is purportedly heating up, uh, people draw a blank. Ever since I learned of Mike's experiment, I've been intrigued by this result. Whenever I've given public talks in Australia, England or North America, I've asked the room the same question. I, I thought I would put the question to this room. Can anyone here explain the mechanism that causes global warming? As they emit um, gases that rise into the atmosphere and um, increase um, increase the layers of greenhouse gases found in the atmosphere, which has the effect of keeping the sunlight that hits the Earth inside that layer rather than being reflected off the Earth and back out into space. But I guess then the question is, wouldn't these greenhouse gases also stop the energy from the sun from coming in as well? Um, I, I do see your point there, um, and to be honest, I don't have an answer to that. It turns out few people actually understand the mechanism driving global warming. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, but what does that mean? 
With an actual greenhouse, the glass walls let sunlight in. But the glass also traps heat, so it warms inside the greenhouse. Greenhouse gases work in a similar way. They're invisible to sunlight, so the energy from the sun passes freely through our atmosphere and warms the Earth. The Earth then glows with warm infrared radiation. And here's the key. Greenhouse gases trap infrared radiation. That's the dynamic of the greenhouse effect. It lets sunlight in, but it traps infrared heat, like a blanket keeping our planet warm. It's basic physics and chemistry. It's physics and chemistry that we have known since the 19th century. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. That means that it's relatively transparent to visible light, but relatively opaque to infrared. Or make it even simpler, light comes in, heat gets trapped. The physics behind that causing warming are the same physics that the Air Force used to put sensors on heat-seeking missiles. And in some really fundamental sense, if you deny the global warming effect of our CO2, you are claiming the Air Force doesn't know what to put on their heat-seeking missiles. Despite what you might have heard, this is not new in controversial science. We've known about the greenhouse effect for nearly two centuries. Uh, Joseph Fourier, a scientist who's well known for um, the, uh, the mathematical technique known as the Fourier series. Um, he is the same scientist who produced the law of heat conduction. He's the guy behind the law that governs how heat moves through substances. He understood that there was a greenhouse effect. For over 150 years, scientists have been predicting what global warming from increased greenhouse gases should look like. And that's what makes science so powerful. It's not just ideas and conjectures. Science makes predictions that you can test by taking measurements and collecting data. And over the last century, scientists have been collecting climate data. What they've observed is a number of human fingerprints, patterns that are unique to greenhouse warming. Scientists have interrogated many, many different aspects of the climate system, not just looking at one number, the average temperature or average moisture or average pressure, but looking at complex patterns of change in hard observations, the latest, greatest satellite observations, the latest, greatest climate model simulations. And the red thread running through all of this fingerprinting work is natural causation alone doesn't cut it. It doesn't explain the changes in all of these things that we've actually observed. Over time, um, the evidence has become more and more overwhelming that we're having a very damaging effect on the climate system um, because primarily because of our love affair with um, oil and fossil fuels. Because of all this evidence, there's overwhelming agreement among climate scientists that humans are causing global warming. In 2009, scientists from the University of Illinois in Chicago found that among climate scientists actively publishing climate research, 97% agreed that humans were significantly raising global temperature. A year later, a separate study from Princeton University found that among scientists publishing peer-reviewed climate research, 97% agreed with the consensus position that humans were causing most of global warming. The, the people that are, are publishing climate scientists, they're, they're real experts that self-identify themselves as climatologists, that's 97, I think it was 90, 98%. So we compiled large lists of scientists and we found that of the the most expert scientists in the field 97 to 98 uh, percent were convinced by the evidence of anthropogenic global warming. In 2013 I was part of a team that analyzed 21 years of published climate research. We found that among papers stating a position on human-caused global warming 97 percent endorsed the consensus position. When our paper was published what surprised me the most was how surprised everyone else was by the result. Ours was the third study to find 97% consensus among climate scientists. Nevertheless, the paper attracted quite a lot of attention. Some 97% of scientists who have written in peer-reviewed journals say the following. Climate change is real. It is significantly caused by human activity. It is already causing devastating problems in our country throughout the world. 97% of peer-reviewed climate studies confirm that climate change is happening and that human activity is largely responsible. 97% of scientists, including, by the way, some who originally disputed the data, 
have now put that to rest. They've acknowledged the planet is warming and human activity is contributing to it. Since the day our consensus paper was published in 2013, it's been attacked hundreds of times by people who deny the scientific consensus on climate change. This 97% figure has been repeated over and over and over again by such a wide variety of people. A paper came out in a journal which I suspect was created just so that they could publish this paper. 97% is bogus. But this 97% is essentially pulled from thin air. That 97% number, that, that's been debunked in several studies. This might be a good time for me with uh, without objection to put into the record an article from the Wall Street Journal three days ago, May 26. Uh, the headline is The Myth of the Climate Change 97%. The 97% figure that's thrown around, the head of the UN I I IPC said that number was pulled out of thin air. The stat about the 97% of, of, of scientists is based on one discredited study. Now, most scientists aren't terribly thrilled when their research gets relentlessly attacked. But I'm in a bit of a unique position. I research misinformation and attacks on science. For me, attacks on my research by climate science denialists aren't just attacks, they're data. I've never heard of any scientist complaining about having too much data, so it would be somewhat ungrateful for me to complain. It turns out there are five telltale characteristics of science denial. You see these five traits, whether a person is denying climate science, vaccination science, or even the scientific evidence for biological evolution. Those five techniques are fake experts, logical fallacies, impossible expectations, cherry picking, and conspiracy theories. A useful way to remember them is the acronym FLEC. Explaining the techniques of denial is a powerful way of neutralizing the influence of denial. My journey for the answer to climate science denial ends here in Paris, just a few blocks from the Eiffel Tower. I'm standing outside the Institut Pasteur named after Louis Pasteur, who did groundbreaking research into vaccination. His work was instrumental in stopping the spread of infectious diseases. As we head towards the Paris climate negotiations in December, the answer to climate science denial is inoculation. Explaining the science isn't enough. We also need to explain how that science can get distorted. Just like a flu shot exposes people to a weak form of the virus, we can build resistance to misinformation by exposing people to a weak form of misinformation. It's a big task. But inoculation eradicated polio. We've nearly completely eradicated smallpox through inoculation. The psychological research into inoculation theory tells us we can also reduce the influence of climate misinformation. That approach also deepens people's understanding of the science and imparts the critical thinking skills to see through the techniques of science denial. And most importantly, it removes a roadblock to the action we desperately need to avoid the worst impacts of climate change.